We can we can take off our masks, yeah. So all right. And the tribunals. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the European Commission's uh, press room uh, today, 14th of July. The College of Commissioners held its weekly meeting this morning and they discussed the, back, the package of proposals linked to delivering on our commitments on the European Green Deal. President von der Leyen will deliver the readout of the college meeting. She is accompanied by the Executive Vice President Timmermans and the team of commissioners involved in this package. President, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And um, I'm, uh, let me start by saying that I'm very happy to be back in a busy press room to present this package. So that's good to see all of you. And I'm delighted to be joined by part of the team who made this package possible. And at the very beginning, many, many thanks and my respect to Franz as the first executive vice president who is leading the Green Cluster and to you, the commissioners uh, of what you achieved from Janusz to Adina, Paolo, Kadri, Virginius. Thank you very much. This was an enormous effort, but the result speaks for itself. Um, this group here does uh, represent not only the, I think, outstanding knowledge and the excellent teamwork within the Commission, but it also reflects the whole of government approach or the whole of society, whole of economy approach. And this was the message almost exactly two years ago to the day, it was the 16th of July, um, when I put on the table my political guidelines and in there the core part was the European Green Deal. The overarching goal was, and of course is, to make Europe the very first climate neutral continent in the world and to build a new growth strategy to get there. Um, I remember not everyone agreed at that time and there were very vivid uh, debates. But now two years on, we have come a long way. We now have a shared sense of purpose. We have a shared sense of direction. We know where we want to go and what we need to do to get there. We know, for example, that our current fossil fuel economy has reached its limits. And we know that we have to move on to a new model, one that is powered by innovation, that has clean energy, that is moving towards a circular economy. And this is why we set out to make the climate goal not only a political aspiration, but also a legal obligation. And thanks to our new European climate law, this is exactly what we now have in place. Two years ago, we also set out our vision about that transformation. And today I'm proud to say that we have made good on our commitments. Europe is now the very first continent that presents a comprehensive architecture to meet our climate ambitions. We have the goal, but now we present the roadmap to how we are gonna get there. Our package aims to combine the reduction of emissions with measures to preserve nature and to put jobs and social balance at the heart of this transformation. And it also shows the value that this transformation will generate and how public and private investment can and will, of course, work together to make it a reality. We should always keep in mind roughly one third of next generation EU and the European budget will support green projects, sustainable projects all over Europe. This is more than 500 billion euros at the European level alone. Then you have to add the national provisions in the national budgets. And this all gives, and we feel it already, we see it, certainty and incentives to the private sector so that they complement that, for example, through investing in green bonds that are making our financial system more sustainable. So today, it is about putting all of that together in an architecture that can drive us to where we want to go. We have the goals, we have the climate law, 
We have it all underpinned by investment, and now today it's about the roadmap. The roadmap to our new target of at least minus 55% of greenhouse gas emissions till 2030. We chose carbon pricing as a clear guiding and market-based instrument with a social compensation. And the principle is simple. Emission of CO2 must have a price. A price on CO2 that incentivizes consumer, producers and innovators to choose the clean technologies, to go towards the clean and sustainable products. And we know that carbon pricing works. Our existing emission trading system has already helped significantly to reduce emissions in industry and in power generation. So we will strengthen the existing system in these sectors and we will make emission trading system applicable to aviation and extend it to the maritime. We need this because we just have to consider that one single cruise ship, cruise ship alone uses as much CO2 per day, like 80,000 cars. And then we will build a second ETS, a second ETS on buildings and road transport because we all know that buildings today consume 40% of the energy consumption and the road transport emissions have continuously increased, not decreased, but increased. And we must reverse this trend. We must reverse this trend and we must do it in a fair and in a social way. And let me step back for a moment from the specific example if you look at transformations in Europe, every transformation we were successful when we combined market-driven measures with the right social balance. And this is at the core of our social market economy. Therefore, we call it a social market economy. And in this spirit, the climate transition will be accompanied by a social climate fund. This fund will support income, and it will support investments to tackle energy poverty and to cut bills for vulnerable households and small businesses. So this is real support for those that need it most while the pricing is effective. And this is real solidarity between member states and within member states. We are presenting today um, the market-based tools and tangible investment complemented and underpinned by a comprehensive regulatory framework. And I will ask my team in a moment to present the proposals to you, but allow me a few final thoughts. Europe has always been the continent of scientists and innovators. And we cannot always compete with the sheer size of our competitors. Or, for example, the amount of natural resources they have. But we can rely on the most precious renewable re resource in the world. And this is our ideas, our ingenuity, our innovative power of our people. It is this spirit that should give us the confidence that this generational change is not only realistic, but also optimistic. We very often talk about taking our destiny in our own hands. This package, this transition, is the true meaning of that. The more inclusive, the more successful it is today, the more we will have the freedom to act tomorrow in the future. And over the next days, you will hear a lot more details about the proposals and the percentages, the acronyms, the allocation fees, that go with them. These details do matter, but so does the bigger picture. Change on this scale is never easy, even when it's necessary. And for that reason, there are some who will say we should go slower, we should go lower, we should do less. But when it comes to climate change, doing less or doing nothing, literally means changing everything. 
The infernos and hurricanes we have seen over the last few weeks are only a very small window into what our future could look like. But by acting now, when we still have the policy choices, we can do things another way. We can build for our future by design and choose a better, a healthier, and a more pro a prosperous way for the future. I'm deeply convinced and my team is deeply convinced that this is our generational task and it must unite us, it must encourage us. Because this is about securing the well-being not only of our generation, but also of our children and of our grandchildren. And I think there is no greater and no more noble task than that. And Europe is ready to lead the way. Now I would like to give the floor to the first executive vice president, Franz Timmermans, who is in charge of the overall green cluster and the European Green Deal. Franz, please. Thank you very much, President. And let me start by thanking you, all my colleagues here present, and the, the ones who are not here, and especially the Commission staff, for an incredible effort over the last couple of months. This is really epic, what our colleagues were able to offer us in terms of quality, in terms of depth, in terms of analysis. So I believe we now have a package that can take us to our goal, which is now a legal uh, obligation of reducing our emissions with at least 55% by 2030, which will set us on a path of climate neutrality by 2050. As the President has said, um, there is no time to waste. Um, people are dying in northwest Canada because it's 50 degrees Celsius there. Northwest Canada. Siberia reaches uh, temperatures over 35 degrees. Um, Central Europe is over 40 degrees. We saw tornadoes in the Czech Republic. Who would ever have thought of that? So anyone who wants to deny the urgency of the climate crisis should look again. And we certainly don't have the luxury of denying it. And as the President said, sometimes people say, whoa, take it easy. Not that much. It's difficult. It's hard. Yes, it is difficult. Yes, it is hard. But it's also an obligation, because if we would renounce our obligation to help humanity live within planetary boundaries, we would fail not just ourselves, but we would fail our children and our grandchildren, who, in my view, if we don't fix this, will be fighting wars over water and food. So that is, in my view, the background of our efforts. But these efforts are very concrete. They have to do two things at the same time. Put a price on carbon and put a premium on decarbonizing. That is, in fact, what we're doing. We're putting a price on carbon so that people have the incentive to use less carbon. And we put a premium on decarbonizing so that we stimulate innovation, adaptation. We stimulate the bringing to the market of new technologies, et cetera, et cetera, that will take us uh, to where uh, we need uh, uh, to be. You know, there is the famous quote um, in, in Hamlet. Um, Time is out of joint, oh cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. That's it. Time is out of joint because humanity no longer lives within planetary boundaries. We were born to contribute to set it right. That is to help humanity learn to live within planetary boundaries. If we get to minus 55 in 2030 and uh, climate neutrality in 2050, humanity has a fighting chance because the rest of the world is watching us, is following us, and is really looking towards us for the best examples to get us there. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, Hans. Now I would like to give uh, the floor to the Kadri Simpson, the Commissioner for Energy. Thank you, President, and uh, thank you, France, for your leadership. So um, reaching uh, the Green Deal goals um, will not be possible without uh, reshaping our energy system. This is uh, where the most of the emissions are generated and um, where change needs to happen first um, to make it possible elsewhere. Uh, by 2050, most of our energy has to come from renewable sources. As you know, planning and building energy infrastructure takes time. So to get to net zero by mid-century, we need an unprecedented transformation during this decade already. Uh, the steady renewables evolution in the recent years and decades must become a, a revolution. And with our proposal to revise the Renewable Energy Directive, we are making that possible. 
Renewable electricity has by now become the cheapest option in many places, and often it's European companies and European technology providing uh, the green power uh, by pushing our 2030 renewables target to 40%, we are not only promoting cleaner and cheaper energy production, we are also boosting an, an economic sector with remarkable potential to create jobs, growth and trade. With renewable energy as a dashing but protagonist of the Green Deal, energy efficiency is the unsung hero without uh, whom nothing would ac actually happen. So everything we are presenting today will become impossible, or at least very difficult, if we do not reduce the amount of energy we consume. Um, being more efficient will, Im will immediately cut our emissions, ease the pressure on the environment and reduce the need for energy and other resources to support our way of life. So energy efficiency not only enables green transition, it also makes us um, um, possible to re reach just transition. And increasing our effic efficiency allows us to slash energy bills and tackle energy poverty. And this is why we are proposing to upgrade our energy efficiency directive. Change of this scale is never easy. Today's proposals will require serious efforts from all member states and from our businesses and societies. But being greener, smarter and faster also brings huge opportunities um, that we should be quick to grasp. Thank you. Thank you, Karel. Paolo Gentiloni, for the economy. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know if I should stay. <laughs> um, so, good afternoon. Where Thank you. you. Feel comfortable? <laughs> uh, thank you, President. The, no, okay, we are very proud of the leading role of the EU, and I think today we are confirming this leading role. Of course, uh, early movers have uh, advantages, but are also facing risks. And the risk here is what we call the carbon leakage. So the fact that you have uh, production shifting towards countries where standards are lower, or on the contrary, um, imports uh, with higher content of emissions entering in our markets. For this reason, we are introducing this uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. We are doing it gradually um, with a full compatibility with WTO rules. Uh, we are putting the same price to domestic production and to imports. Um, this will be a sort of premiere at international level, and this means that also we are ready to try to find a balance between our ambition and the necessity of global cooperation, because you need ambition, but also global cooperation to have result from this point of view. CBAM, as we call it, is not a tax, it's an environmental measure, but we need also taxes uh, to influence positively our behavior, and this is why we are reviewing our energy uh, taxation directive. It is 20 years old. It is still uh, uh, financing, subsidizing uh, fossil fuels, and we have to cancel exemptions for fossil fuels and change uh, the method of the energy taxation directive. We will not uh, has as base for taxation the volume of fuels, but their energy content. Of course, we will from, uh, have from this a contribution exactly to do what we are looking for, to put a price to uh, carbon emissions and to incentivize positive evolutions. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Um, Alina Valian, now for the transport. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm putting forward three proposals for transport, uh, refuel aviation, fuel EU maritime, and alternative fuels infrastructure regulation. All present a ticket to economic growth. They will create a market for sustainable alternative fuels and put in place the right infrastructure to get zero emission vehicles on our streets and in our seas and skies. I prepared a couple of figures for you today. 
Transport is today a source of 29% of the EU total greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Uh, by 2050, we need to cut by 90%. As we speak, sustainable alternative fuels uh, in aviation account for less than 0.1% uh, of total EU jet fuel consumption. And our goal is to uh, go up to 5% in 2030. 5% might seem modest, but it means multiplying the quantity used by 50 in less than 10 years. In shipping, Fossil fuels still account for over 99% of the fuel mix. By 2035, we want a 13% reduction in the greenhouse gas intensity of energy used on board ships. Road transport has the advantage that it started decarbonization earlier, but 20% of all greenhouse emissions uh, still come from our roads. Zero emission cars and lorries are already a reality, but so is the lack of infrastructure to recharge or refuel them. We want charging capacity equivalent to around 16.3 million points by 2050. Finally, for hydrogen, we need one refueling station every 150 kilometers along the 10T uh, network and in every urban node on the 10T. So these proposals will take us beyond greening mobility. This uh, is a chance to make the EU a lead market for cutting edge technologies. Uh, studies show that 92% of the sustainable aviation fuels could be produced in Europe. For example, creating more than 200,000 jobs in the renewable energy sector. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you very much, Adina. Now, Janusz Wojciechowski for the agriculture, please. Thank you, uh, Madam President. That's uh, a very important part of uh, the package uh, adopted today is the forest strategy, very important document. And uh, forests uh, play a critical role in uh, many priorities of the Green Deal. And uh, this uh, very important, uh, forests are very important for um, climate adaptation and climate mitigation. I think that the key word uh, used in this strategy is multi multifunctionality. This is very important that uh, our approach is uh, respecting the all um, functions which uh, our forests plays. That is very important to, to mention because there was a lot of concerns that uh, the forest strategy will the forestry strategy will be first of all uh, forest protection. Yes, this is very important for the environment to protect our forests to avoid the uh, process of deforestation of the European Union, but we respect uh, all functions of, of uh, our forest, the economic functions, as a wood industry. Um, uh, uh, forests are very important for this, and as a place of work, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of workers in the forestry sector. And uh, the, also the social aspects, like the forests can be the place of uh, tourism, place of, of, of rest for, for our citizens. Uh, very important is link with, uh, b between the forest strategy and the common agricultural policy adopted, uh, the, uh, finalized as a political agreement uh, two days, two weeks ago. And uh, we have instrument for um, improvement of uh, our uh, uh, manage forest management in the common agricultural policy which are eco schemes. We propose in the recommendations sent to the member states that uh, agroforestry and uh, joining the, the uh, uh, farming and uh, agricultural practices and uh, forestry practices is very important and also carbon farming as a potential eco schemes. We spent in uh, the, the current, uh, the, the last uh, financial period, 6.7 billion uh, euro for uh, forestry in in uh, um, budget that uh, now the the idea is to spend more and encouraging farmers uh, forestry uh, owners for improvement uh, their uh, practices and uh, first of all afforestation uh, that's uh, and avoid the deforestation and the better management of of our forest thank you thank you very much and now virginia sinkevich is for the environment fisheries and oceans Thank you very much and good afternoon to, to everyone. Let me put a little bit more emphasis uh, on forests. 
And I'm very proud that today, together with the Fit for 55 package, we have a forest strategy. Because forests play a vital role. We're talking today about legislation and important changes, but also we're not forgetting about forests, which are a huge carbon sinks, and also they host uh, a huge resources of biodiversity. Most important with our strategy, that we aim at protecting our old growth and primary forests, but also restore those degradate, uh, degraded ecosystems, which due to increased pressure, all, also due to climate change, unfortunately, we are losing here in the EU. But most importantly, that we're building in resilience. All the multifunctionality, what my colleague Janusz mentioned, can be only maintained if our forests are resilient to climate change and future shocks. And therefore, we will also roll out a very positive and engaging initiative of, of uh, planting 3 billion trees around the EU. Not all trees planted can be called forests, and that's why we will go a step ahead, looking at specific areas, specific species, which can be planted and create the forest of the future. That we will do with, of course, enhanced cooperation with our member states, building on their best practices. Thank you. College. Now, the executive vice president and the commissioners present on stage will present you the building blocks of these proposals over the next two days. So you will have plenty of opportunities to ask questions uh, to them. Um, and the president will be uh, now available to, uh, to take uh, a few questions. So I will try to make a mixture of questions from the press room and from the colleagues, the many of them, almost 200, who are connected uh, remotely, so um, I will start um, in the order in which I have them on the list with a question from um, Anna Gelinek, who is in the middle. Thank you. I don't know if I remember how to use this microphone in the press room anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Um, a question in German to the President, if I may. Um, Frau Präsidentin, um, es war ja offenbar schon in der Kommission nicht ganz einfach, sich auf die Ziele, uh, auf das Datum für das Ende des Verbrennermotors und auf den uh, separaten Emissionshandel zu einigen. Um, was heißt das für die Einigungschancen mit den 27 Mitgliedstaaten und für das Erreichen der Einsparziele? And the question to Vice President, first Vice President Timmermans, if I may, where do you suspect the fiercest resistance to your plans? Deutsch machen können, oder? <lacht> ja, lassen Sie es mich einbetten in einen größeren Rahmen. Der europäische Green Deal ist im Prinzip unsere Antwort auf den Klimawandel. Ähm, unser Ziel ist, dass wir unseren Planeten erhalten wollen, aber wir wollen auch unseren Wohlstand erhalten. Und wir sind fest davon überzeugt, dass wir das können, wenn wir stark investieren in Innovationen und in saubere Technologien und saubere Produkte. Und da müssen bei, diesem, bei dieser Reise müssen alle Sektoren mit beitragen, natürlich auch der Autosektor. Ich finde ganz interessant, dass in den letzten Wochen und Monaten die Autobauer zum Teil selber schon die richtigen Antworten gegeben haben. Denn wenn ich die letzten Wochen anschaue, ungefähr ähm, ein Dutzend der großen Autobauer, sowohl in Deutschland als auch in Europa, haben angekündigt, dass sie ihre Flotte umstellen werden auf ausschließlich emissionsfreie Fahrzeuge, unterschiedlich in den Jahren, aber das ist der Zeitraum von 2028 bis 2035. Und wir haben uns an diesen ehrgeizigen Zielen orientiert. Der zweite Punkt ist, wir sehen auch, dass die Menschen diese Entwicklung wollen, ein rasanter Zuwachs an Registrierung von elektrischen Autos, allein verdreifacht im letzten Jahr in der Europäischen Union, also das zeigt auch, die Nachfrage ist da. Und deshalb wissen wir, dass die dritte Komponente wichtig ist, dass wir auch investieren. Insbesondere auch die öffentlichen Investitionen müssen dabei sein, sowohl von den Mitgliedstaaten als auch von der europäischen Ebene. Und das sind vor allen Dingen zum Beispiel die Batterieallianz. Das sind in manchen Mitgliedstaaten die Zulagen beim Kauf von emotionsfreien Autos. Aber das ist natürlich auch das massive Investitionsprogramm, für elektrische Ladepunkte oder insgesamt überhaupt äh, nachhaltige Ladepunkte in Europa, das durch Next Generation EU nach vorne getrieben wird. Und es das zeigt, dass dieses Gesamtpaket der Schritt nach vorne ist im europäischen Green Deal, 
dass wir durch Innovation, durch die Investitionen, durch die sauberen Technologien diese Veränderung ähm, nach vorne bringen wollen. Hans. Well, I, I think frankly that um, what we present is a holistic approach, a package. That the package will get us to minus 55 in 2030. Now I'm sure that parts of the European Parliament and parts of the member states will not like elements in the package. But we have tried to make a balanced package. If you don't like an element in the package, we can talk about that. But you can't uh, dispute the goal, which still has to be minus 55%, because that is set in law. So if you don't like part of the package, come with an alternative that could deliver the same results. Um, we are open for that discussion. We will have to be, of course. And you will see that member states and parts of the European Parliament will sort of criticize some parts of the package. But then that's, that's how it works in Europe. Then we start discussing and we find a common solution. So I think at the end of the day, people are most worried, is this going to be fair? I think fairness is a crucial point here. Fairness within societies and fairness between member states. The onus is on the commission to prove that this leads to solidarity and to fairness in this transition. If we can prove that, I think the resistance will be less. If we fail to prove that, then I think the resistance will be massive. Thank you very much. We will now take a question from a colleague connected remotely, and the floor goes to Mateus Schiffers. Mateus, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. <coughs> this is Matthijs Schiffers from Het Financiële Dagblad, Dutch Financial Times. I've got two questions for Mr. Timmermans. Um, the first question is, which of these measures uh, that you announced today uh, do you find the most difficult to take? And the second question is, do you as a social democrat think that a social fund of roughly two, 20 billion a year will be enough to fight energy poverty in the European Union? I don't really have a preference for which is more difficult. All of them are difficult. I mean, nobody should have any illusion that anything is easy here. We have to be honest. It's difficult, but we need to do it. We need to do it. And then on the Climate Social Fund, I think this is a wonderful instrument because it could not just help us avoid that vulnerable people who are uh, um, at risk of getting into energy poverty because of these measures can be supported to avoid that. We can also tackle, uh, more than that, also existing issues of energy poverty because the fund will be big enough uh, to look at that as well. So I am really enthusiastic about this. If member states embrace the idea and if we can get it uh, going, I think this could lead to a change of behavior, both of those who will be uh, affected, which are the producers of energy, and it could help the change of energy consumption also by our citizens, with the strong support from the European Union and the Member States. Thank you very much. I will take another question from a colleague connected from a distance. Quentin, are you still there? Oui, bonjour Dana, uh, bonjour à tous. Et je peux poser ma question en français, c'est bon? Nous avons... Nous avons... Pour reprendre... Super. Oui, c'était pour savoir, est-ce que vous pensez euh, que les mesures actuelles pourront éviter des mouvements sociaux comme on a pu avoir en France avec les gilets jaunes Comment finalement, est-ce que vous pensez que ces mesures-là sont assez justes pour éviter d'avoir des, des protestations dans le futur So, what we do explicitly is that we acknowledge that today it is already difficult for some people to pay their energy bills or their mobility bills, for example, to drive. Um, and that we give, first of all, an answer to that open question by first of all, putting in place the social climate fund. And it is tailored specifically to address that question. The social climate fund will not only be direct income support for small incomes, but it also will go into uh, investments in innovation so that, um, for example, uh, the market for electric vehicles becomes broader and as you know, if the demand rises and the supply rises, the prices tend to go down, that is good. Or for example, that heating systems that are modern become more affordable 
and will be uh, installed in housing. Or we have the strong renovation wave that is financed by Next Generation EU. So this will be first of all in place. We have Next Generation EU, then overlapping the Social Climate Fund will come. And only then we start to build the emission trading system, the price on carbon for road transport and housing, so that we have always an answer for those who cannot adapt, who have a hard time to adapt because of a small income. But overall, we don't lose the perspective for our common goal to reduce carbon. In the very end, carbon is damaging, in a way, our climate and our environment. And those who suffer the most from that are always those with the smallest income. So it's in our overall common interest to support those with the smallest income, but also to show them the way, as a society, how we can improve the situation of housing, of mobility, while preserving our nature. Thank you very much. This concludes the college readout. Um, I thank all the members of the college present on stage, but stay with us because in a few minutes, Executive Vice President Timmermans and Commissioner Simpson will hold uh, a press conference to present one of the building blocks of this package. Just bear with us for a few minutes uh, to change the setting and stay tuned and thank you. Alors, mes amis, merci beaucoup.